Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have once again this morning to open your word. And we're looking forward to what you are going to show us, uh, things that uh, are new and old. And we just invite your spirit to work upon our hearts and lives. Uh, that you can, that your angels can watch over each one, and that we can draw close to you and to one another. We know, Lord, that the time we're living in is difficult, and we pray for each of the persons who are studying these things, that you can help them in their day-to-day -day life. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Now, um, we're, we're probably going to finish off this chart. And I, I added one thing to it, and I just want to explain it. So I was looking at this. Uh, well, maybe I'll just sum this up. So what we have here is all of the chronological dates in the Book of Esther, including um, uh, the apocryphal Esther, and that's going to give us Mordecai's dream. And we can see there we have the first day of the first month. That's the first angel arriving. Uh, that's the second year of Xerxes. And then the, the first angel is formalized on the first day of the first month. That's when Xerxes begins his planning. And then there's 187 days going to Vashti's um, being dis deposed as queen. And then we get to the second angel arriving, and that's going to be Esther's wedding on the first day of the 10th month. So this is a symbol, of course, that we have in the book of Ezra, when they begin the divorcement. But here this is a wedding. It's the opposite. And um, and then we have uh, the 16th day of the first month when Esther makes her plea and has the golden scepter held up for her. And then that's going to, 66 days later, it's going to happen again. Um, she's going to have the golden scepter held out, and Esther's decree is going to be issued. And 256 days later, uh, the decree of Haman and Esther's decree both go into effect. <clears throat> and, and then we have, of course, with each of those, we have the dates on the Julian calendar. And then we also have made an application of those waymarks to our history. So we're connecting at the beginning there, those two uh, periods of uh, the, the one year apart of 384 days, two to the power of seven times three, three is 384, it's a symbol of the Levites. And we have, of course, one uh, embolismic year, and that's what they call a regular embolismic year. And um, we connect those as symbols as 9-11, and 11 9. And then we have July 18 is Vasta, Vashti being deposed. So that's that's going to be the 26th day of the fourth month on our biblical calendar in, in our times, July 18, 2020. And then we have Esther's wedding marked by December 6, 2020. It's the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar. And that's going to be followed with the second angel formalized on. Uh, December 25th, 2021. It's also the 20th day of the ninth month. So we have a lot of these rep repeating sort of dates. And then we had spent some time yesterday looking at um, uh, Esther's decree, looking at the, the golden scepter being held out. And we, we decided, based upon the symbols, that this is going to be the first day of the first month in 2023 that we mark Esther's decree. Now we don't have anything for that date as an event that I know of, but March 23rd, 2023 as a symbol can represent in this line, um, Esther's decree. That's how we're, we're looking at it. Now we still have this 66 days to understand a little bit better what it means. Um, between these dates, uh, as you can see, if you look at April, um, uh, 
April uh, 20, 20th, 474, right? We got that down there and you can see the number of days between that to, you know, the 66 days, right? And we also have this three days here. So when uh, um, Haman's decree is issued as three days before Esther's plea. So we have the symbol of the three days, which we get in the story of Ezra as well. Um, so first, before we get to some of these other things that I want to look at, just addressing um, this 256 days. So I looked at it and thought about it a bit. And if you look at a period of seven years of 365 and a quarter days, it's going to be uh, uh, 2,554 days, roughly, right? So if I multiply seven times 365 and a quarter, I'm going to get, um, what am I doing here? Yeah, so seven times 365 and a quarter. I'm going to get, uh, that, that was wrong. Um, yeah, 2,556. Point seven five days. So basically 2,557 days. Now that's, if I took this 2,560 and I just multiplied it by 10, I would get 2,005 or 256 and multiply it by 10, I get 2,560, which is just simply three and a quarter days longer than uh, seven years. So is it is it reasonable to say that 256 days can represent seven years? Not exactly to the day. And if we look at the period of time from March 23rd in 2023, which is the first day of the first month, and we go to April 5th, 2030, which is also the first day of the first month, Right? Um, we have seven years. Now that's going to be a bit longer because you can see we're going from March 23rd to April 5th. So that's going to be another 11 days over a um, Gregorian year. So it's 11 days more from March 23rd to April 5th. But can we say that that 256 days represents seven years. Is that reasonable? So you say that 56 days represents seven symbolic years? Yeah. Well, it's going to represent seven years in our time because we're going from March 23rd, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. That's seven years, seven biblical years, right? In that history from Esther's decree to the decree going in effect, it's 256 days. So that's one tenth of seven years. Um, I can show it, show it to you this way. So if you want to kind of see it more uh, readily. So, so if I look at this calculation, so if I take 256 times 10, that's going to give me 2,560. And if I divide this by 365 and a quarter, so that's right here, you're going to see it's going to be 7.00889, you know, so that's really seven years and uh, three and a half days, three and, well, three and two quarter days. Right, because if I subtract seven and then I multiply that by 365 and a quarter, you'll see I'll get, oops, what did I do wrong? Oh, yeah, I can't do it that way. Here, I'll do it this way. So seven, I have to subtract the seven and go equal. Right, and then I multiply this by 365 and a quarter. And you'll see I get three and a quarter days. So that's that's how much it's off from seven 
Gregorian or Julian years, right? It's, just, it's pretty close. Probably the the question. Another, probably need another witness for that, you know. Um, sometime, sometime down the line, if God opens something up. Um, well, we've had lots of yeah. So, so we so we have a. I mean, obviously, for April fifth, twenty thirty, we've had lots of witnesses for April fifth, twenty thirty, right? Yeah. Yeah. For the same a way mark on our lines, we can save that. And, you know, then we marked March 23rd, 2023 is the first day of the first month, because it is in our history. And um, we chose that symbol uh, for what reason? Why did we mark March 23rd, 2023? Because the date above in Esther is the 23rd day of the third month. Right. So we just said, well, if we look at the 23rd day of the third month in this year, right, that's going to be March 23rd. It's going to be March 23rd in any year. But why we would mark this one is because of um, the fact that it's the first day of the first month, right? So we have that symbol of the first day of the first month. If we mark March 23rd in other years, it's not going to be the first day of the first month. So the fact that March 23rd is the first day of the first month in this year tells us that it's, it's probably the correct year to take that March 23rd. We'd have to, um, and it falls in that period of 323 days. Okay, so that is, um, so you're saying, yeah, yeah. So in, in, the, in the story of Esther, it's in a period of 323 days from Esther's plea, the decree going in effect. Right, so, so we have this March 23rd symbol, right? It's the 323 symbol. And in this year, it happens to be the first day of the first month. Now, we have the first day of the first, first month at the beginning of these first two way marks, the first angel arriving and the first angel formalizing. And would it make sense then that if we're going to look at this third angel arriving symbol, that we would place it seven years later on the first day of the first month in 2030? So we're just going to say that decree goes into effect symbolically in 2030, right? Because we already have that, that date, April 5th, 2030. So the 256 days will equal seven years as a symbol because it's one-tenth of a period of seven years. If you just, if you rounded it up, or rounded it down, whether you're doing uh, biblical years or whether you're doing Gregorian years, 2,560, 10 times that, would be about seven years. And so we have these first day of the first month in 2023, and we already have the first day of the first month in 2030. So that 256 days seems to apply as a symbol of seven years in our time. So it's it's not seven years in Esther's time, it's a tenth of seven years. <clears throat> Does that make sense? You're making a good point. Okay. Yeah, because we already kind of know that we should be going to the first day of the first month as a symbol, right? Just from the structure of this chronology itself. Now we have this March 7th, um, 473 BC as a symbol of the Sunday law, but it's not a Sunday law, right? It's a type of a Sunday law. And, and that would mean if we looked at our history that we're not looking at the actual Sunday law, Yeah, so, and, and Aran points out seven years is 2556 five, days, so 256 is the same combination. So it's another way of looking at it. 
two five five six days is seven years. So two fifty six days can represent seven years. That's probably a simpler way of looking at it than what I did. But um, so it is seven biblical years from the first day of the first month of March twenty third of this year to the first day of the first month in twenty thirty. But but it means that in our history we're not looking at April fifth twenty thirty as being the Sunday law, right? Because we're not predicting the Sunday law. And, and we're only saying that this is a symbol. We're not, we're not even saying that April 5th, 2030 is ever going to occur. I mean, the world could end before then. So we're not, we're not time setting because we're not predicting an event. But we are showing that there is a structure here that points to um, our history. Our history is not the time in which the Sunday law is going to occur, right? That is, we have within this movement people who believe that the Sunday law is imminent. It's going to happen under Trump, that Trump's going to become president again at this election that's coming up. Or if not this election, in some way in connected with whatever's going to happen. There's going to be some event or something. Trump is going to end up as president. And we can see that that doesn't make sense based upon how we have studied these lines. That Trump is Xerxes, but Trump has a limited role as Xerxes. That is, Xerxes, as a symbol, represents more than Trump represents as a person, right? So we can see that in, in this whole, the first three chapters of Esther, Xerxes is Trump, but when we get to chapter four and onward, we don't see Xerxes pushing for a Sunday law. In fact, he's doing everything to counteract a Sunday law, right? So much so he enters, he issues a decree that causes God's people to protect themselves. So Xerxes can't be Trump initiating a Sunday law. Now we know that the, that 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 decree that issue the decree that's issued is done through deception. So it fits into what we understand already that Trump was deceived. He issued orders that were typical of a Sunday law because we were in a typical Sunday law in the time that Trump was president. Right? Correct. Pandemic was a type of the Sunday law. We all recognize that. So that has occurred. But when we get past that issuing of the decree in the story of es Esther, Esther makes a plea, and Xerxes now is not supporting this Sunday law. He's opposed to it. But the law of the Medes of the, and the Persians cannot be changed. So there's a 66 day period from Esther's plea to the issuing of Esther's decree. That's still under Xerxes, right? So that can't be representing, you know, Xerxes can't be representing Trump unless you're saying that Trump is going to become, you know, supportive of those who are opposed to the Sunday law. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Maybe we can say Xerxes is Trump there. But whatever we're doing there, Xerxes is not supporting a Sunday law, right? That, that at least we can say. And, and we think that this is referring to the history that we are in. That is one of the things about the book of Esther that we had decided, that it was a typical line that parallels this movement. And we've done that with Ezekiel. We did that with uh, um, the story of the judges. Every time we look at these things, we see the symbols that tie this to our history and give us light for our history. And so we know that as we move towards whatever this event is that, that April 5th, 2030 symbolizes. April 5th, 2030 is not the date of an event, but it symbolizes an event that is still future. And it's a type of a Sunday law. It is there are going to be things that happen within our history, within this time that this movement is existing, 
that bring us to some kind of a point that is symbolized by the decree going into effect in the story of Esther. And, and we have the symbol there of July 18, 2020, right? Because the 13 times 12 times 12 is 1872. We have the first day of the first month symbol. And remember we have in uh, Millerite history, we don't begin on the first day of the first month, and then we get to the 10th day of the seventh month. But we don't come back to the first day of the first month in Millerite history. But we do in the story of Ezra. Story of Ezra in 457 BC begins on the first day of the first month and ends on the first day of the first month. And so my suggestion because of that, and because the 2300 months brings us to the first day of the first month in 2030, that what it's, what it's showing, what it's illustrating is that our history is a complement to what happened in Millerite history. That is, it becomes complete in our history. Millerite history is tied with our history. This repeat of history helps complete the work that was supposed to be done in Millerite history. And it's symbolized by April 5th, 2030. So this movement has this work to do that is a repeat of history. Now we know we can't predict the Sunday law, the close of probation, the outpouring of the latter rain, or any promise of special significance. But what we have done with time is we are able to measure the time and recognize these way marks as we pass over them that affirm what this movement has always taught is that we're, that there is a repetition of Millerite history, particularly uh, the parable of the ten virgins, the first two messages. And we can see that our movement has repeating, has been repeating that history. And from what we can see is that we we can't we can't ignore the fact that we're in a typical history that we're not in the actual history of the Sunday law that is since 911 the mighty angel of revelation 18 came down and we know that happened in in adventist history too because that happened in 1892 as well right in a symbolic way, it's something repeat, you know, symbolizing our history. So, <clears throat> so I I think this answers our question that that we've been having, the question you know that was basically asked on December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, is how do we how do we understand our history? Now, there's still more to be questions to be answered, but. Since I knew, and we should have known, that we're in a typical history and we had examined the foundation before December 25th, 2021, and we knew that there was mistakes made by the Millerites and we knew what those types of mistakes were. They were taking things literally that should have been understood as symbols. That is, if we think that we're actually in the history of the Sunday law and not in a typical Sunday law. That is, if we think that these events right now are leading directly to a Sunday law that we're reading in the newspaper, uh, that and and what's going to happen between you know the Republicans and the Democrats are going to directly br bring a Sunday law in the very near future, we can say that that has to be. It, it could be soon, but it can't be that soon. That is, we know there's all kinds of things that have to happen first. Now, sure, the final events will be rapid ones. But the events that we are looking at are still typical events, not the actual events. Right? Is that, is that what we understand? Yeah, um, excuse me. I, I, I did have the hand raised. I'm trying to figure out, like, I came in a bit late and I, and you're talking a lot. I just didn't, I'm just kind of slow here. But where you have the three, two, nine, one inclusive days, and then you have two, the 13th day of the, oh, I was thinking, I was looking at the 13th day to the 12th month to the 12th year. Now I know this is the 13th day, of the first month of the 12th year. Okay, maybe that's where I stumbled. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, so there's 3,291 days from the first day of the first month and the third year of Xerxes. That is the same number of days from December uh, 21st, 2012, which starts this 777 prophetic mirror that ends on December 25th, 2021. So the reason we could take this chronology that we laid out and say, well, that's December 25th, 2021, was because of that 3,291 days. And then we could also notice from the time that Vashti was deposed to December 25th, 2021, is, um, or I shouldn't say that, to the, the 16th day of the first month, which we're going to mark as December 25th, 2021, is seven times, 777 seven, seven times four, right? So 3,108 days. So these are just like a second witness for that date in, in that line. And we know there's yeah, this. Have to review today's and today's, and it was quick. I'm just kind of mm -hmm. groggy this morning. Yeah. Okay. So, well, yeah. So we established that we have all these different symbols: the 384 days between December 6, 2020, and December 25, 2021, which we have at the beginning, right? And so. So there's a lot of mirror structure here and things that tie us to our lines, to the symbols in our lines. So it doesn't really make, you know, we couldn't argue that this is all just coincidence, that this chronology of Esther ties us to our history because it does, right? I mean, right from the 187 days of the feasts, etc. But now we have this 256 days. So we go from Esther's decree, and we marked Esther's decree as March 23rd, 2023. And we did so because when we put March 23rd in 2023, it's the first day of the first month. And that's an important symbol. So, so we're taking that third day of the 23rd day of the first month in the 12th year of Xerxes, and we're just placing it in, in our time here. Now, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, it's the 12th year. Now, we haven't really addressed that too much. But, um, you know, if we go from uh, 2023 and we say, well, wh what's the 12th year? What, what, what are we, does that have any significance at all? The 12th year. Does that have any connection to our movement, to our history? The only thing that comes to my mind right now is Christ going going to the temple and speaking with with the rabbis when he was twelve years old. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. So I mean, there's a symbol like that. So we can say, well, that has something to do with becoming a child to becoming a youth. Um. Now, you know, if we looked at it sort of more literally, I mean, if you go 12 years back from uh, 2023, I mean, it would bring you to 2011. You know, if we went back, though, to saying it's the 12th year, uh, that would also tie us to 2012, right? And, and 2012, I think, becomes more important than, let's say, 2011, because 2012 is where we're going to have uh, this um, at the end of 2012. But we're going to have December 21st, 2012. This structure begin, right? This, this whole structure that we've talked about, the 777 structure, which where we get the 3291. So, so maybe it just ties us back to that. You know, so I don't know. But, but we have that 12th year. Now, there was the significance of the idea uh, that we have the third year, um, uh, the seventh year and the twelfth year, and and of course, what is that? What was the significance of in in the 
the Hebrew dealing with this, we have the third, the twelfth, the third, seventh, and twelfth years. Why was that significant? Anybody remember? Well, if you multiply them, it's 252. Right. So you get this 252. And, you know, and we, we, we have, of course, the fact that if we plot, multiply uh, 13 times 12 times 12, uh, we get the 1872. So we have these symbols of July 18 and 252 all just intertwined with each other in this structure. We have so many symbols that relate to um, our message in in these in these structures you know, in, in just very different ways. Uh, I don't think that we can just you know, set them aside and say they're not important or they're not there's some kind of coincidence. So so anyway, all I'm suggesting here is that we're we're gonna we we can complete this line all the way up to the third angel's message in just the same way that we completed the lines with um, the book of the judges. It brings us to April 5th, 2030. As the end of this movement, as far as its chronological significance, not that that on that date it ends, but just that there's a limitation to where this movement can go. Right. That is, we have time right now and we have an additional extension of time, right, which leads us to April 5th, 2030. So now we just say, OK, you know, we had this work to do. We have laid out before us that, that God has given us extra time, that we have this work to do. We have a message to develop and present. We have to present it to the Levites. And that's in God's providence. It's not like we know exactly how we're going to do that. But we do know that that is our work. Our work is not the one of bickering and infighting, of trying to prove who's right and who's wrong, of trying to predict what's going to happen in the short term. Because that, that's not our message. We, we, we definitely, as Seventh-day Adventists, have a message to give to the world. And, and that's never changed just because we're in this movement. We just have more information. And, and of course, we have uh, um, light that can bring power and conviction so that, you know, if we follow this, we should be united on the fact that we have this work to do and and that we have to figure out how to do it and and that's where i have this you know this great difficulty with where the movement is right at the present time yeah so Angela just laid that out, the third year of the military campaign planning. But stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. Uh, the seventh year you have the wedding and the twelfth year of the death decree with Esther's plea and alternate decree. Yeah. <clears throat> so and then we did address the 793 years. So we could see that that's part of a structure. Um, and that it brings us to March 7th, um, 2021, which is when this movement began examining the foundation. So in a sense, this kind of brings us around full circle. Um, that we're, we're saying that March 7th, 321 is the actual Sunday law. That is, we call that the first Sunday law. So we can see that this story of Esther is typical of a Sunday law but it's tied to a Sunday law by Pi, right? So we looked at that yesterday. And 
And so that March 7th, 321 date, which we, we commented on back in March 7th, uh, 2021 as being 1700 years. That's when I first did the calculation about pi tying those different periods together. So, um, so that means we, we can look at, uh, the fact that our movement in, in examining the foundation and looking at the past is giving us light for the Sunday law ahead. So that March 7, 321 AD Sunday law is pointing forward to the Sunday law. Right? Because the first Sunday law definitely typifies the Sunday law. We have other typical Sunday laws, Daniel chapter 3, Esther chapter 3, right? But Constantine's Sunday law is a Sunday law. These other ones are not Sunday laws. The pandemic is not a Sunday law. It's just a type of it. Okay. Um... Okay, so I don't know what else we can do with this, with this line. I, I don't really want to go through the rest of Esther because I don't think that that's, because we have done it, right? And I don't think we're going to find something more. We, we basically summed up this story of Esther. Um. So if we go back to Daniel, uh, right where we have been, we can see that according to the scripture of truth, Xerxes is going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. That brings us to the story of Esther. But now we come to verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So we know that we can find this uh, passage connects us to other passages in the book of Daniel. Right? Because who does according to his will? The papacy don't right? <clears throat> the papacy does. Right? So um so we know the papacy does, but we also know in chapter eight, um Greece does according to his will. Or is it uh let me see, is it Persia or Greece? I think it's Greece. Uh, where was this? Yeah, so that's that's going to be this ram. So this is going to be Medo-Persia does according to his will, right? And then we can see in chapter 11, Greece does according to his will. And then we're going to see it's going to be in 11. Uh, we're going to have pagan Rome do according to his will and papal Rome doing according to his will. So I can't remember where it is. Okay, now this with the mighty king that shall stand up and rule with a great dominion and do according to his will. Yeah. Is this verse not connected with both Daniel eleven sixteen and eleven thirty six? Yes, those are the ones I'm looking for. So eleven sixteen. Um, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed so this is uh, Rome right pagan Rome I would have to agree and then we see this also with papal Rome 
and the king shall do according to his will in verse 36. That's the papacy, not France, right? I would agree. I would agree to. Above every God or everything that's called God or that is worshipped so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God. So we know that Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that he's referring to this verse primarily. Right? Verses 36 and 37 of Daniel 11. Well, okay. There's other verses that he's referring to, but when he talks about the man of sin, the son of perdition, he's not referring to uh, Medo-Persia. He's not referring to Greece. He's not referring to pagan Rome. He's referring to papal Rome, right? And that's where you're first going to have this with papal Rome. I mean, you also have it in Daniel chapter 7. But primarily, he would be referring to this. So, uh, so we have this characteristic of doing according to his will through all of these nations. Okay, so you had a comment there, uh, Dwight. Well, <clears throat> I'm in agreement with what with what's being said right now about 1136. But I was looking further at some of the other notes that had been made on 1116. Okay. Because when the translators were putting this together, they gave good support to what was just being presented, that this would be pagan Rome, Mm -hmm. because they made use of Daniel 8, verse 9. Yeah, dealing with, um, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Correct. Or, or this land. But then they also paired that with Daniel eleven forty one and 45. Right. Yeah. Now, at this point, the other verses that they were they were giving reference and using had this going back to Daniel eight four and eight seven. Yeah. Because it it comes back to all of this with the ram showing us the progression from Greece to Rome. Right. So, and, and we're going to have to look at this in more detail as we go on, but not, not today. But the one thing that we know is that we can take, um, we can take, you know, for instance, the image, and you can sort of line it up in different ways, right? That is, you can look at the beginning, at the end, and it matches. God declares the end from the beginning. I'm not want to go into that in too much detail right now but um so when we look at the characteristics of babylon we know that babylon represents this idea of an empire right it's this worldwide empire it's the leadership this king this authority right and then meta persia is going to conquer babylon and meta persia is going to have this characteristic of the law of the medes and the persians right so it's still going to have empire. It's going to have an empire. But it's based upon law, not upon force. Right. Right, primarily. Right. So it has it, – it builds its empire by building roads and infrastructure and creating laws so that people are safe, so that people can prosper. Now, now Greece has a characteristic, um, which – you know, we would say, you know, there's Greek philosophy and there's science and there's art and all these different things, education. Um, now, Greece has other characteristics. I mean, it conquers really quickly. Alexander the Great does, right? That's why he has four wings. You know, there's four heads, though, of course, as well, because we know his kingdom's going to be divided to, four, uh, to the four winds of heaven. There's different characteristics that, that Greece has. But the primary characteristic has to do with its um, um, its philosophy, its art, and and also its forms of government that it you know becomes a d democracy, at least the idea of a democracy. Now Rome, it's it's going to take all of these, 
but it's going to form the Roman Republic. So the law of the Medes and the Persians that can't be changed under Rome, they're going to be a republic with a constitution, right? Constitutional republic. But we know that Rome is going to uh, devolve into uh, um, uh, uh, and, well, where you're going to have an emperor, but but the is imperial Rome, right? So it's going to be basically a dictatorship. So, um, so that's going to happen. So, so you have all this progression of these kingdoms. The point is that each of these kingdoms has characteristics that apply at the end of the world, but the one characteristic that 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 comes first with me to Persia is that he shall do according to his will. I mean, this idea is, is the rule of law, right? But it's going to be distorted and perverted as we move through history. That's the way that I look at that characteristic. Now, <clears throat> so when we get to the characteristic of doing according to his will, that we see in Alexander the Great, right? Because that's how we understand this historically fulfilled. The mighty king that shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will is Alexander. We know that, right? And then we have to apply Daniel chapter 11, the history, and we have to apply it to our time, right? So this is, you know, part of what happened on December 25th, 2021. There's this idea, well, we take Daniel chapter 3 and we, we look at the image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up. It's going to be all gold, all the way through. So you can take that image, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, divided Rome, right, right to the end of, of the stone hitting the foot of the image. And we can say, well, that's going to be Babylon all the way through. But we can see that, you know, we're dealing here with the kings of Persia in Daniel chapter 11, and Persia represents the United States. And so if we keep going through, the idea was, well, the mighty king that shall stand up, that's going to be Trump because we've made this application. But we know that there is something that happens in this story, and that's what we're going to be studying as we start to go through the seven kings of Persia. So. We talked about this before. We have to understand our application of the seven kings of Persia. Those are going to, the first seven kings of Persia, are going to bring us up to Artaxerxes. They're not going to bring us, they're not going to stop at Xerxes, and they're not going to bring us to Alexander, right? Because Artaxerxes, there's still going to be other kings of Persia after Artaxerxes. And so we have to understand, well, why is that? And then with this count here, this is not the seven kings of Persia, even though it sort of is, because it only goes, well, Darius the Mede is not a king of Persia, so we don't count him as a king of Persia. He's a Median king. And, and this one's going to be in the time of Cyrus, right? So, so, I mean, he's the first Persian king. And then it says three are going to stand up, so you're going to have four kings, and then there's going to be the fourth, which is really the fifth, if you're counting Cyrus as the first. So it only brings us up uh, to Xerxes, right? And so we have, to, we have to explain that. Why does this line, this repeat of history, why, when we're making this application of Daniel chapter 11, which is an application, right, that is, this is not how Daniel 11 is primarily understood. Now we know that all of these things that happened in the past, all these things were written aforetime, were written for our learning upon whom the end of the world has come. So the prophets in the past speak more for, more for our time than their own. But we still have to understand what they were speaking for in their time in order to apply it to our time, right? We don't interpret these prophecies directly. 
we look at the history that has occurred, and we know that Ella White says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated, or much of the history in connect connection with this prophecy will be repeated. And so we look at the history, and then we see how it parallels our history. So when we did that with the book of Esther, which we've just done, we can see how it parallels our history. It's a typical Sunday law. It's something that we've experienced and gone through, have gone through. It's typifying the big Sunday law that's still future, but it's also typifying our history. Right? So, so that's what we have to, we have to, uh, we have to do. We can see that when a mighty king shall stand up, it doesn't make sense to apply the riddle of Revelation 17 to a resurrection of Trump. And, and we're going to go through that. We're going to go through it methodically. But we can't just take the kings in the way that, that Colin has and just say, well, that means Trump is going to be the eighth. Right? So, so we're going to go through it. Now, people have criticized me because I make these statements and I don't prove them. But, but we're going to show by looking at it why we can't do that based upon what we already understand as in this movement, how we already understand Revelation 17. Because the primary thing about New Light is that it's an unfolding of established truth, right? New Light never undoes the old. Amen. Okay. So, and, and we know that in our history, we've made an application of Revelation 17. And in no way am I saying that that application is false. But in order to understand it correctly, we have to also understand how the pioneers applied Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Obviously, they didn't see everything that we see. But you can't just ignore it. You just can't say, well, their application of Revelation 17 differs from ours, so theirs is wrong. Because it's not wrong. Actually, our application only makes sense if we understand the pioneer's application. That is, we need to understand it is an application. It's not the direct interpretation of the prophecy. And that's the mistake that we made when we were looking at Revelation 17 in this movement, is we didn't realize that we were just making an application of, of Revelation 17, which, which we're going to show as we, we go through these studies. Right. And we sort of showed it when we went through this, the presidents of the United States. Um, but there was not enough pieces in place, I don't think, for everybody to understand what we were doing. So we know a mighty king that shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will, is Alexander the Great. But is he typifying the papacy or is he typifying the president of the United States? I would say the papacy. Right. He's typifying the papacy, right? Because this characteristic is a characteristic of the papacy, not a characteristic of the president of the United States. Can, can we agree on that? It makes logical sense. Yeah. But would it not be someone, someone associated with the United Nations? Okay, so, so what Stephen is asking, well, we know that Greece typifies the globalists, right? Agreed. Um, does Rome uh, 
inherit all of does Rome inherit all of the qualities of the kingdoms that go before it? And does Rome unify those qualities and characteristics? I believe that's the pattern. Yeah. So when we look at the United Nations, the United Nations is not going to act independent of the papacy in the Sunday law, correct? You understand what yes, I'm saying? The whole world wanders after the base, so. So this is all about the papacy. So we agree that this, Alexander typifies Greece. Or, I mean, the, the globalist, because he's Greece. And so it's, it's giving us these characteristics, but we can take all of these kingdoms and we can place them at the end of the world, right? You know, what Persia does typifies events at the end of the world. What Babylon does typifies events at the end of the world. What Greece does typifies events at the end of the world. And so, so we know that this is the globalists. But we know it's also the papacy. Because all of these are, to some degree. Now, when it comes to Persia, I mean, Persia... So we can take these kingdoms, Persia, and we can line it up with the United States. So it's one of the things we're going to do, right? We're going to do what we've done before, but we're going to line Persia up in 538 with the United States in 1798, right? Okay. Is, is the three decrees parallel the three angels' messages? And so we can go, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, right? And Babylon falls, spiritual Babylon falls in 1798, Babylon falls in 538, right? October 13th, 539, but 538. So you got 538 BC and 1798 AD. You both have Babylon falling, the papacy, right? in 1798, literal Babylon, in 538, so literal and spiritual. And then Persia parallels the United States that rises, right, in 1798. Okay. So, so we, we, we've done that already, right? But we also take that history, so we have the days of one king, right? That's the period of the United States. Right, the 70 years. That's Persia. That's the US. That's also Babylon, right? You understand what I'm saying? Because we take Babylon, which is going to have this 70 year period, and, and we're going to place it with the United States as well. So we've, we've, we've aligned Persia with the United States, but we can't ignore that we've aligned Babylon with the United States. This is what Jeff has done, and, and we have to agree with it because it's correct, not because Jeff said it. Yeah, that would that would bring us to the <clears throat> um, the beast, the um, dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, all of them at, at, at the end. Right. So we're going to have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, all of them at the end, the three powers. Mm -hmm. You know, the false prophet reaches its hand across the abyss and joins hands with spiritualism and, and does the same thing with uh, the papacy, right? They have a threefold union, right? They're going to bring about the Sunday laws, the final events. But we can see that we can start in 1798 with the United States as being a parallel to Persia, but also a parallel to Babylon. The United States is also a parallel to Rome as well. Just look at the United States as, as a republic. A.T. Jones does this in the book, The Two Republics, where he shows the fall of, well, the building up and the fall of, of Rome, the Roman Republic. And he shows that it parallels what happens with the United States. 
And Greece also typifies the United States. How does Greece typify the United States? The educational system. <laughs> yeah. We would say, you know, the educational system, right? So it's modeled after Greece. So, you know, it has, it has different aspects of these different nations, but all of these typify the United States. But yet the United States itself is the false prophet. So we, we can look at these past histories and we can see the parallels. The thing is, there are many parallels. There isn't one parallel. All of them have to be considered. All of them have to be looked at. If we're going to understand where we are in history, if we just pick one of them and ignore the others, we're going to be misled because we have to take everything that applies and bring it together. Right? And, and we know that many of the things that have happened um, in the past, you know, in, in Millerite history, and in Adventist history, early Adventist history, later Adventist history, all these things are being repeated in our time. They're, they're typical histories. All history is typical. And, and the difficulty that we have as a movement, the difficulty that we have to, to face in studying prophecy is we can't just pick and choose. Right? We can't just um, look at a few things and draw a conclusion. We have to look at everything. It takes a lot of work, right? So there is a complaint that, well, we should be able to have like a study or two and understand the, the problems. And the thing is, we could, you know, we could uh, have these problems solved much more simply than we do. You know, for instance, the 2520. Is it a complicated study? No. Well, it's simple, right? But what makes it complicated? Why, why do people find it complicated? Isn't it because of all of the types of arguments that are brought against it that have to then be answered? Yes. Right. So people pile all kinds of garbage upon things. Like even the sanctuary truth. It's a simple truth. Look at the but, opinions of leaders too. Right. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> you have you have all of this what I would call garbage brought against the truth. And it's what makes the truth complicated because people bring up all these op oppositions. So like with the twenty five twenty you know, people say, well, nothing happened in 677 B.C. and and Judah didn't fall in 723. And, and you know, this state's wrong and that state state's wrong and all these different things. So you can present the 2520 to somebody and they say, well, this is wonderful truth. And then they, uh, you know, get a paper by Steve Wahlberg or they get something from, uh, you know, and they start arguing about all these other little things about Ellen White's, which is the longest time prophecy. And then you have to start looking at all these other things. And it just, the more you study the opposition to the truth, the more complex it becomes. And, and so people keep bringing up issues that God then has to answer, right? Now, you know, so we just live in this day and age, a day of information, right? So there's lots of information. In the past, we wouldn't even be able to, to look at all of these things because we just wouldn't have had the information to do it. But we can still know the truth because the truth is testified to by the Holy Spirit. And so if we want to know the truth, we can know it. But that truth is going to have to change us. Now, what I'm going to say is going to sound a little bit harsh, a little bit mean. Um, so I don't want it to be misunderstood. 
But the reason I know that what I said was the truth on December 25th, 2021, the strongest argument I have is the opposition that came against it. Because what kind of opposition came against my questions to call them? Was it logical scripture being presented? No, it was emotional. It was emotional and it was... Party spirit, would you say? It's like a party spirit. Well, it was attacking the man, right? And that's what it's always been, right? So I know that if somebody has is teaching error, it's simple. How do you how do you address somebody teaching error? You just simply present the truth, right? Amen. You study the truth. That's what we're doing. We're just studying. We haven't engaged in attacking individuals or people's characters other than you know what i'm saying right now could be seen as an attack but i just know that the the way in which people oppose truth is much different than the way in which we oppose error so to me it it's quite simple that, you know, when I when I see something that's true and I present it and I have an emotional reaction, I have that person, you know, upset with me, then and, and no real arguments, just posturing, then I, I'm kind of like, well, maybe I'm on the right track. Right? That's why I accepted the 2520 initially. It wasn't so much that I understood the whole thing and I could prove it. But one thing I could see is that the opposition to the 2520 was extremely, um, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen in Adventism. I, I hadn't even seen that much, that type of opposition against the nature of Christ or righteousness by faith. There was just no discussion, right? Not even a room to put for that person to even listen to what you were saying. Right? That's what we experienced. Agreed. It was a satanic opposition. And so I said, well, you know, if the conservatives in Adventism are making these types of arguments against something that are just ridiculous arguments that they don't even, you can't even tell what the 2520 is when you read their opposition to the 2520, then obviously there must be something there. Because it'd just be simple to show where it's wrong, if it's wrong, but it, and, and it should be, you know, clear and simple. It shouldn't be contradictory. It shouldn't be just people throwing mud at the wall to see what sticks, because that's all it was. And, and so the same type of thing has happened here, in my view, right, is that God has given us some light, and we could have studied it. We could have acted as Christians. We could have said, okay, there's some things that we have to study here, and let, let's just buckle down and do it. But that hasn't been done. And all we've had, in my view, is a constant repeating of the same ideas again and again without looking at the whole picture. And we don't know yet what the conclusion is going to be, but we have hints at it, right? Because all the study that we have shown has shown that we are in a typical history. And so we need to recognize that this movement is going through an experience that, that was typified by Millerite history and early Adventist history, and that we now have to do the same things that they did. We have to study, we have to take our time, we can't be rash, we can't be emotional, we can't have a party spirit, we have to be dedicated to know what the truth is, because we're going to have to write the truth, write the vision, and make it plain upon tables. 
we're going to have to have a message that can be seen and understood by Seventh-day Adventists. So that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to line up in these studies. So, so we have these verses, he shall do according to his will, right? That's Greece. We already saw it in chapter 8, right? And then we see it here again, and we all agree that this is Rome, right? 11 verse 16, that this is, is pagan Rome. Do we agree with that? That he shall do according to his will, his own will. It would have to be pagan Rome. Right, because that's how it's always been understood. Everybody should agree with that that's pagan Rome. And then we yes, also agree. agree. Yeah, and then we also agree verse 36 is papal Rome. Agree. Okay. So that means all of these, these kingdoms in that aspect, doing according to his will or his own will, is in verse 13, uh, verse 16, is, is typifying here what the papacy is going to do at the end of the world. And this is the law that's going to come, the, what we call the Sunday law, right? this overflowing scourge. Right? This is the manifestation of the will of Satan against God. but all in a pretense of being law, but it's not rightful authority, right? It's not God's authority. Okay. So we're going to have to, to study Daniel chapter two again, right? And understand how it relates to Daniel chapter three. So if, if we're going to think about this a little bit, I know this gets a little bit analytical, but in Revelation, we have these three different beasts that all have seven heads and ten horns, right? We have pagan Rome, which is primarily Satan, but it's also uh, secondarily pagan Rome, right, in chapter 12. We have the composite beast in chapter, tw in chapter 13. Right, so let's just go there quickly. Right, and we, we've gone through this before, but remember... This one has crowns upon its heads. So there's seven crowns. It's going to be there in the time of Christ. It's pagan Rome. And it's going to be replaced by papal Rome. So we see in chapter 13, we have papal Rome rise. And it's going to have ten horns with ten crowns upon the horns. So it's a different period of time. But it's, it's in a sense, it's kind of the same beast, but it's not, right? It's the kingdoms of this world. Lots of different things but it has the same symbols but they're different and we know that this is a composite beast that is the papacy has all the characteristics of all these other beasts right it's the diverse beast of Daniel chapter 7 and we know that that that, that beast Rome of course it's going to tread down or pardon me it's going to scatter and then Papal Rome is going to tread underfoot. So you have these two different characteristics of Pagan and Papal Rome. Pagan Rome scatters God's people. Papal Rome treads underfoot. And, and we know that um, when it says one of these heads were as it were as it wound, wound, wounded unto death, you know, we have taken that to be that's the papacy, right? Correct. We, in Revelation 13, we say, well. One of the heads is wounded unto death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And so what we say, well, okay, that's the papacy, right? Now, the pioneers understood this a little bit differently, so we're, we're going to look at that. But um, I still think that we can understand it that way. I don't think that we, we need to change our understanding of it. But we need to understand why we're doing what we're doing. That is, we could argue that this is pagan Rome, this is papal Rome, and chapter 17 is modern Rome, or Rome at the end of the world. 
right? Because there are different aspects of Rome. And so there are ways in which we can look at each of these beasts and understand uh, that they're not the same beast, even though they have a lot of the same characteristics. Because we know this one, there's seven heads and ten horns, but there is no crowns upon the heads of the horns, right? So we, so we know it's different. But the point that we, when we look at, we look at these three um, symbols, uh, we can line this up to some degree with uh, the prophecies in the book of Daniel. That is, we can look at uh, the image, right, that, that Nebuchadnezzar sees. And that would more line up with, in a sort of uh, analogous way, with chapter 12. All right. Chapter 7, and, and, and we would see this in the symbols that are used. Chapter 7, which is about the beasts, that's going to more line up with chapter 13. Right? Because you're going to see a composite beast. It's going to take all of those beasts of Daniel chapter 7. And it's going to put them into one beast. Okay. So what vision in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, would we say is analogous with Revelation 17? Maybe there isn't one, maybe, but I'm just saying that chapter 2, the vision of chapter 2 is analogous with chapter 12. Vision of chapter 7 is analogous with chapter 13. And what vision would in Daniel would be analogous with chapter 17? Or is there one? And what would be the arguments for that? What do you mean by um, analogous? Is that what you say? Analogous just means it's, it's, it's comparable. It's an analogy. Right. OK. Um, so it's, it, you know, in a sense, it symbolizes it. But they, but they line up together because we know Dan, the book of Daniel is a complement or the book of Revelation is a complement to the book of Daniel, whichever way you want to look at it. But right? they go together. They're the same book, really, because what's sealed up in the book of Daniel is unsealed in the book of Revelation. So is there something that we can say about um, Revelation 17 that can tie us more directly to the book of Daniel than any other vision or prophecy? Well, one of the, uh, the themes that you have in Revelation 17 mm -hmm. is there's a, a deadly wound, and then the wound is healed. Everything like the, the fifth or the uh, it's one of the seven. The eighth is one of the seven. Yeah, the eighth is one of the seven. And, uh, I remember Jeff tying up to Revel to Daniel chapter seven, where you had ten horns and your feet plucked up, and you then have seven horns, and then you have this little horn coming up. So the, the argument there was the, eight, the papacy was the eighth there. Um, okay. And the seven. He also tied that to Revelation 13. With the, well, the, and the it's end there, you have ten horns. Go ahead. Yeah, so there's no doubt that in chapter 12, 13, and 17, you actually have connections to Daniel chapter 7. Because because you have these beasts, right? And they're going to have some similar characteristics. So, so you do have, you know, the deadly wound in chapter 13. In a sense, that's connected in chapter 17, too. The idea that, um, you know, there's going to be this eighth that's of the seven. So, so there's lots of things in these three beasts in Revelation that we could tie to 
Daniel chapter 7. But, you know, even when we look at Daniel chapter, or Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to see this when we look at this in more detail, um, this, this, this story here um, at the beginning, you know, about the man-child, and, and then there's going to be this 1,203 score days, which is going to be the period of the papacy. I mean, the question is, how would I tie this to Daniel chapter 2? Like I, I said that I did, right? I said, you know, it's more analogous. It's tied to it. It's, it's more, there's symbols here that tie us to Daniel chapter 2. Why did I say that, right? So if you look at Daniel chapter 2, we all know it. But... You know, this is going to be a golden image, right? Or not a golden image, an image. You know, Babylon's the head of gold. You got Medo-Persia, the arms and breast of silver. And then you have the belly and thigh of brass. And then you have the iron. And, and I'm saying, well, you know, this dream of Nebuchadnezzar's um, ties us to Revelation 12. Well, how does it do that? Because all, all the things here, you could say, well, Revelation 12 is much more connected with Daniel chapter 7. So what is it that I'm looking at that I'm saying that it ties us to that? Yeah, so so we can see lots of things in Daniel 11, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 7, Jan, Daniel chapter 2. I mean, they're going to be repeated in the book of Revelation. Now, remember, the book of Revelation has um, a series of prophecies at the beginning, right? You're going to have uh, the seven churches, uh, the seven seals, and then the seven trumpets. And then once those are done, you're going to have this new series, which is going to address uh, the beasts primarily, right? So uh, Revelation is in 22 chapters. The first 11 um, are going to be uh, parallel in some ways to the first 11 generations up from Adam to the flood. And then you got the next 11 so that's the 11, 11, making 22, right? And, and you can actually take the first three visions, the first seven times, the, the ones with the sevens in them, and you can parallel them to uh, the visions of Daniel as well. But the question is, what is it that we're looking at? What would tie us, help tie these things together? Because we're going to have to look at this, you know, tomorrow a bit more, but I want you to think about it. <clears throat> okay, so what is the, here's a way to look at it. So what is Daniel chapter 2 doing? What is it showing us? What the kind progress, of? The progression of nations. Okay, now how much detail is it giving to us? <clears throat> is, is Daniel chapter 7 a repeat and enlarge of Daniel chapter 2? Yes, it is. Okay, so. Sorry, enlarge. Yeah, and is. Uh, and then what's the repeat and enlarge of Daniel chapter 7? Is that going to be repeated and enlarged in where? Well, Daniel 2. Okay. But it's, going, it's, going, it's going to be in Revelation 2, I think. In, uh... Yes. But, but within the book of Daniel itself, you first have these kingdoms, right? All right. And, Rome. and then you're going to have... The same kingdoms repeated. And what about Daniel chapter 8? 
But no, it, it drops it, it drops the kingdom. It usually drops the kingdom off, don't it? In other words, it goes from it goes from the kingdoms in Daniel two, and then in Daniel seven, it drops them. It drops one of the kingdoms off, which would be. Not in, it doesn't drop it in Daniel seven. In, Dan, in Daniel eight, Babylon is dropped. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Daniel eight. I apologize. But, but what you see is, is, is a repeat and enlarge. That is, if if we're going to look at Daniel more detail. 7, more detail. More detail. Large, more, yeah. But you, you're going to understand Daniel 8 only if you study Daniel 7 and 2. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so when we look at Revelation 12, it's giving us some information. Now, the information that it's giving us is uh, pagan Rome, right? Right. Where, where Daniel, Daniel, Daniel 8 is giving us uh, um, the um, religious aspect of them, ain't it? Okay. Because yeah. it's got the, it's got the, it's got the um, sanctuary animals in them. Well, so one of the things you see is that it's going to give us, uh, you know, in the first the first one in Daniel is going to talk about uh, Daniel chapter two, basically the kingdoms. It's, right. it's focused on um, the heads of these kingdoms, right? and primarily, you know, their empire aspect of them. In Daniel chapter seven, the beast aspect. Wh- why does it have this beast aspect? Well, it has to do more with the per- persecution of God's people, right? In Daniel chapter seven. Right, these these beasts and and their conquering power. Ultimately, uh, that power is going to be pers- persecuting God's people. Right. Right. It is in, in the first one in Daniel chapter two. It doesn't really say anything about persecuting God's people. Right. Right. It's about those kingdoms themselves. And then in chapter. Eight, it's dealing with the religious aspects of those kingdoms. Right? So when we look at Revelation, when we start looking at these these um, these visions, we need to recognize they're repeat and enlarge. Just as these three are repeats and enlarged. Now we also have a fourth vision in Daniel. So the way that I look at Daniel is we have chapter two, chapter seven, chapter eight, and chapter ten to twelve. Chapter 9 is a special case because it's really part of chapter 8. It's really give, meant to give us not in a repeat in the large of the kingdoms. It's just defining what it's talking about with the destruction of Jerusalem that's mentioned in chapter 8. What's going to happen to Jerusalem, right? That's in chapter 9, right? Chapter 9. So it, it's, it's part of chapter 8. So the 70 weeks is part of the 23. Okay. After 10, 11, and 12, uh, they're going to be more analogous with what happens later in Revelation. So, so once you get to, you know, these, these final chapters of Revelation, uh, they're just going to be dealing with the whole thing at the end of the world. Now, there's lots of different ways in which parts of Daniel connect with other parts of Revelation, right? So there's a lot of interplay. It's not just, it's not very simple and there's some ways in which revelation is a chiasm and there's lots of other aspects about revelation and daniel that ties them together the main thing is if we're going to study chapter 12 13 and 17 we're going to study the beast we need to recognize it's the same idea that's happening in the book of daniel so remember one of the problems that people have when they read daniel is they they can see Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome in chapter two. They can see Matt, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome in chapter seven. <clears throat> right? And, but when they get to chapter eight, where do they get to? They get to Alexander, not to Alexander, um, Atticus Epiphanes, right? Well, I ain't never came to that. Really I know, but I'm just yeah, saying. Well, I'm well, Adventists get come to that conclusion too. Yeah, some Adventists come to that conclusion, right? Yeah. Um, 
And we see the same problem even with Daniel chapter 11, because James White says, well, all of the, each of these lines of prophecy bring us to papal Rome. They bring us to papal Rome and to the papacy, right? Establishes a business. So why are you going to have, you know, Daniel chapter 11, for instance, just bring us to France? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make it all. looking for a literal rather than symbolic representation. Okay, right. So this is, this is why we need to understand that the book of Revelation is written in symbols. The pattern for understanding Revelation is in the book of Daniel. And, and in consistency, right, that is God is consistent in how he does this. He, he's not going to throw in all of a sudden a Tychus Epiphanes, some minor person, um, in, in, into the book of Daniel. He's not going to throw, um, you know, he's not going to have Turkey and Egypt at the end of the world, being, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south, because they happen to have, have those, those territories, right? And the one that's going to do according to his will isn't going to be, uh, you know, France. Right? The one that's doing according to his own will is going to be the papacy. It's only consistent, right? So I know we got a lot of work cut out for us, and I've kind of been a bit all over the place here. But I think it's it's pretty clear what we have to do, and I think it's clear what we will find, you know, when we do this. I, I don't think I don't think there's a mystery of how, how we're going to come to understand these prophecies. It's going to be based on what we understood in the past. There's going to be some things that we're going to find that we haven't seen before. But it's going to be consistent with what we have always understood. And I don't think that making Trump president again is consistent with what we've always understood. I don't think it's, it's consistent with what was taught in the past. It has an appearance of doing so only because some things are ignored. That is, if you pick and choose and you ignore all these lines of prophecy, People have done it many, many times. I've seen Adventists do it all through my history as, as an Adventist, taking something, ignoring historical applications of a prophecy, finding something that seems to fit with what they see in world events happening today, and drawing conclusions about what's going to happen next. And that's not how we study, right? It's not Miller's rules. It becomes highly speculative. You're always going to be disappointed. You're not going to find what you're looking for, you know, to, to be coming. Because it's nearsighted, right? And scripture isn't that way. Sure, God gives us light for our feet. But we know that this celestial city is still a ways off. And we can't hurry it on by taking these byways. That's what I think they are. Yeah, you have to have both. You have to have a, a midnight cry set, cry set up behind you and Jesus' glorious light in front of you. Well, the main problem, I mean, just in, sim in simple terms, is we're unconverted. We can't bypass the cross. We can't, this light that God has been giving us, I mean, we've obviously been ignoring it. Because it's not changing us. If, really, if we really did have the truth, right, it's going to change us. It's going to change how we treat one another. In a treat, it's going to change our lives completely. It's going to change our motivation. It's going to change how we work with others. Right? That's what God wants of us, is to be truly converted. All of us have this work to do. 
and, and God is giving us light. And if, and if we can accept light, then it will convert us. If we reject light, we can, we can go off into darkness. And so we have to be careful. We have to be patient. We have to be faithful laborers in how we study God's word. Right? So anyway, we went a bit over time, but let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this work that you've given us to do. We know that there's a lot of work that lies ahead, and um, there's much that we don't understand. We can see clearly, Lord, that um, there is uh, a message to be given, and we don't fully understand this message ourselves. And so we ask for forgiveness for the time we have wasted in bickering and judging one another. We ask, Lord, that you can just help us to focus on the task ahead. Forgive us for the things that we have done that have hindered your work and help us to know what it is we need to do each day uh, to further your kingdom. Be with us in these studies. Continue to watch over each person with angel's care. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.